Interlink. Hello and welcome to the Y series here in London. Thank you to all of you who are joining us from around the world to hear from Professor John Lennox in just a moment. They have 400 people gathered here together right in the heart of London. And it's my honor and my privilege to get to introduce Professor John Lennox to you. Professor Lennox is Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University. He's lectured globally on mathematics, science, theology, and philosophy, and often speaks at the interface of these themes and on these issues as he presents an intellectual defense for the Christian faith. He's debated some of the most prominent atheists of our times, written multiple books, several of which are available at the bookstall today to buy. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome you to the stage, Professor Lennox. Please, can I invite you to put your hands together, John Lennox. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're sitting comfortably <laughs> because I have decided to join you in sitting comfortably. You know, there's very good biblical precedent. Our Lord sat and taught. And during the years where I traveled to Russia, I discovered that it was normal to sit and teach so that we can share this afternoon as we think about this very important question. Irrational, our God and faith, anti-science and anti-reason. Now, if you look at the pictures there, you'll see me sitting beside Richard Dawkins. And interestingly enough, he founded what he calls the Foundation for Reason and Science. He is probably the world's most famous atheist and would regard the concept of faith in God as being irrational and in fact delusional. The interesting thing is that the building in which we're sitting there is the Natural History Museum in Oxford. It was erected to the glory of God as a deliberate attempt to display some of the magnificent things we find in creation. And interestingly enough as well, it was paid for by surplus profits from the Oxford University Press's sale of Bibles. <laughs> now, the people that erected that building had no sense whatsoever that science and God were enemies of one another. And indeed, we are in Oxford University there. And the motto of Oxford University is, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, the Lord is my illumination, the Lord is my light. And the founders of Oxford and Cambridge and many of the other leading universities in the world saw no conflict whatsoever between theology and science. And indeed, when it comes to reason, they used their reason for centuries. Theology was one of the central themes to be discussed at a very high-powered level in universities around the world. So the idea that there's some kind of antipathy between the two is actually a myth. And it's very easy to see that it is a myth because I would like to suggest to you that if we look, say, at the physics Nobel Prize and you take the two individuals you see in front of you, on the left is Steven Weinberg, who won the Nobel Prize for physics, and on the right is Charles Townes, who won it as well. They are both brilliant scientists they've won the Nobel Prize. But they're very different people because Weinberg is an atheist and Townes is a Christian. Now it stands to sense, does it not, that if faith in God and science were opposed to one another and faith in God is irrational, what is a man like Charles Townes doing winning the Nobel Prize? 
And that teaches me immediately that the conflict is not what many people think that it is. Between the irrationality of faith in God and the rationality of science, it doesn't lie there at all. And I shall unpack that a little bit as we go on. But in fact, what it is, is a worldview conflict. You see, Weinberg is an atheist and Towns is a Christian theist. And I'd like to suggest to you that what is going on here is a conflict, a very deep conflict, between two diametrically opposed worldviews, theism and naturalism. And theism, uh, you will see, says that the universe is not all that exists. There is a God who created it. Naturalism says that the universe is all that exists. They have their different views of ultimate reality. The ultimate reality for a theist like myself is God. It's not the universe. Whereas for the naturalist or materialist, the ultimate reality is, well, you can take your pick, mass energy, a quantum vacuum, but the current view is that the ultimate reality is nothing because the universe has come from nothing. And we live in a fascinating age because we've reached the ultimate polarization, God or nothing. Either God creates the universe or nothing created the universe. We'll have a little bit of look, a look at nothing in a moment or two. <laughs> now, if you are a theist, then your notion of what it means to explain something is very broad because the universe requires both bottom-up and top-down explanation. If you are an atheist, then you've no other choice. The universe must explain itself bottom-up. In other words, mass energy, the particles, the atoms, must in the end be able to produce everything that exists. As a theist, I believe that the universe gives evidence of God but I'm well aware there are many people who think the exact opposite, that the universe gives absolutely no evidence of God. We're facing two diametrically opposed worldviews. There are representatives of them in Oxford University and every other university. They form the major divide in the academy. Now, I am aware there are other worldviews, pantheism, for example, but the major ones that enter the dialogue are the worldview of theism and the worldview of naturalism. And the real question is, where do science and rationality fit? Do they fit best with atheism, as Richard Dawkins would claim, or do they, as I would claim, fit best with theism? Now, the difficulty is, when do you begin to deal with this? People have so swallowed the myth that faith in God is irrational that they come to conclusions like that of Stephen Hawking. Religion is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. Now, Stephen Hawking is a brilliant scientist. He was just ahead of me at Cambridge. I remember him well. He's light years ahead of me in his intellectual capacity as a theoretical physicist and mathematician. But this statement, religion is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark, is not a scientific statement. It's simply a statement of his own belief, his own faith. Now, the title has to do with, are God and faith anti-reason and anti-science? And we need to ask the question, faith in what? You instinctively think of faith in God, but God and faith are separate in the title. So it's actually raising something a little bit deeper than that. Because this is an expression of Hawking's faith. He believes that religion is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. And what we need to take on board is this. He's going beyond science. 
And so, I put it this way, statements by scientists are not necessarily statements of science. In fact, I was asked to comment on his view about religion, and they wanted a one-liner, so I gave the one. I said, atheism is a fairy story for those afraid of the light. <laughs> now, you shouldn't clap, <laughs> because you have every right to say to me, but that's what you believe. That's fine, so long as we can see that these are statements of belief. What we've got to ask is, is there any evidence to support them? And I want to adduce some evidence from three different sources. The history of science first, the nature of science and its philosophy, and possibly some of the results of science. In other words, I'm interested in faith being evidence-based. Because after all, what does faith mean? Fides in Latin is the word from which we get fidelity, trustworthiness. Now, this applies to every area of life, not just to religion. Because what has happened is, people like Richard Dawkins define faith to be a religious word, which means believing where there's no evidence. That's sheer nonsense. Faith is an ordinary word that we use every day. We trust so-and-so. We believe in that fact. And of every statement of faith, whether it's faith in Ireland to win the Six Nations or whether it's faith in something else, you can ask, what is your evidence? Why do you trust that person? That is the kind of thing we mean by faith. Now, the interesting thing is that faith, in this more general sense, is essential to science. And that shocks many people. They think, no, science doesn't involve faith. It involves reason. But half a minute, you reason to get to your beliefs. Your faith is based on reason. They're not opposed to one another. They're involved in one another. And C.S. Lewis once, when he was summing up the work of Alfred North Whitehead, came to a conclusion which is generally agreed with nuances. There's a vast literature in this. But it's a good summary. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature. They expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. In other words, far from belief in God hindering science, you could argue that it was the very motor that drove it. And there, as I say, is a big literature on Christianity and the rise of modern science. Here's a view by an eminent um, academic in Australia. Christianity, he writes, or above all, the biblical doctrine of creation is itself the creator of the methodology of modern science. We don't hold the Greek perspective anymore in spite of the fact that people keep looking back to it as the origin of science. It is not the origin of science. The book of creation is the origin of modern science, the book of Genesis. And so if you go back to the 16th, 17th century, you will see that the major founders of modern science were, without exception, believers in God, like Galileo, like Johannes Kepler, who said something that, of course, all mathematicians ought to delight in. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. And then there's Isaac Newton. Don't doubt the creator, because it's inconceivable that accidents alone could be the controller of this universe. Now, these are some of the brightest people that have ever lived. These are the founders of the science to which we all owe so much in terms of its technological spin-offs. They believed in God. So the idea for them that faith and God 
are irrational and opposed to reason and science is sheer nonsense, historical nonsense. But then we come to something that takes the opposite point of view. Stephen Hawking, I remember that times when it appeared, God did not create the universe. Now the interesting thing about Stephen Hawking is not simply his genius, but the fact that he, until relatively recently, occupied the Lucasian chair in mathematics at Cambridge. The second holder of that chair was Isaac Newton. And here we have the interesting thing, which can focus our problem very well. Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravitation. He believed in God. Stephen Hawking, who occupied Newton's chair at Cambridge, uses gravity as a reason not to believe in God. Now that can focus the question, at least for me, it focuses it admirably. How do you get from Newton to Hawking? And what reason would you have for adopting either perspective? Now, Hawking's central reason for not believing in God is stated in his book called The Grand Design, a co-authored book. In the first famous bestseller, A Brief History of Time, he left little space in the last line for the possibility that there might be a God. But Hawking much more recently has declared explicitly that he is an atheist. And here it is. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And you see the word nothing appearing again. So let us have a look at this. How do we get from Newton's theism to Hawking's atheism? And I want to suggest, and I'm putting it deliberately, very provocatively, that there are three major problems. First of all, there's false logic. Secondly, there are false ideas about the nature of God. And thirdly, there are false ideas about the nature of scientific explanation. So let's have a look at it. False logic. Let's analyze this statement. Now, I know at this kind of a time on a Saturday afternoon, logic may not be everybody's <laughs> chief interest, but nevertheless, let's try. Because there is a law of gravity, that is because there is something. The universe can and will create itself from nothing. Flat contradiction number one. Because there's something, the universe can create itself from nothing. Secondly, because there is a law of gravity, Notice he does not say, because gravity exists. But what would a law of gravity mean if gravity doesn't exist? Because laws only describe things that exist. And so he is again open to serious criticism about a confusion of the nature of law. You see, the laws of nature, ladies and gentlemen, can't create anything. They cannot even move things. For instance, Newton's laws of motion never moved a billiard ball in the history of the universe. People with cues do that. The laws describe the motion. They do not create it. And then, again, the universe can create itself from nothing. Well, if I say to you, X creates Y, what does that mean? Well, roughly speaking, if you've got X, you get Y. If I say X creates X, what does that mean? If you've got X, you'll get X. And what does that mean? It means that nonsense remains nonsense, even if scientists write it. <laughs> this is sheer nonsense. At three different levels, actually. And when I first read it, I was amazed. Now, please. Stephen Hawking is a genius, a mathematical genius, a physical genius. But Einstein once warned us, the scientist is a poor philosopher. And here, in his central assertion, around which the whole book circles, there are three major flaws. I regard that as extremely serious. 
But let's go on. Because you could have a lot of fun with nothing. Indeed, these days I sometimes give a lecture on nothing. <laughs> Nobody listens to it, of course. But <laughs> just listen to this. Now, Lawrence Krauss is a very famous astrophysicist from Arizona State University. And he's written a book called The Universe from Nothing. And early on in the book, you read this. Surely nothing is every bit as physical as something, especially if it is to be defined as the absence of something. <laughs> what? <laughs> that is absurd, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what concerns me is, if you look at the wider context, these are attempts to get rid of the idea of a creator as irrational. But we just examined two statements that are profoundly irrational, given as evidence for atheism. Something is going on here. And I'm going to increasingly suggest to you, it's not faith in God that's irrational. It's actually atheism that leads to the irrational. But we'll investigate that. The second point was that false ideas of God. You see, if you say irrational, God, faith, is anti-reason and anti-science, you would need to ask what kind of God are you talking about? Now, when I was young, which is a very long time ago, nearly a century ago probably, <laughs> if I spoke to a gathering like this about God and used that word, Everybody would immediately understand I was talking about the eternal God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, the God of the Bible. That's not understood anymore. In fact, it's very common to say, well, God, Jehovah of the Bible is just like one of the Greek gods, Artemis, Aphrodite, or Zeus, and so on and so forth. That kind of a God. Now, the problem with that is and I didn't notice this for a very long time, is that that's the kind of God, the Greek God, like the God of lightning, is the kind of God that Hawking and co. think that I believe in. Now, that kind of God is now called a God of the gaps. Put crudely, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. That kind of notion. And you've all come across it. The Greeks didn't understand lightning, so they invented a god behind it. But if you study a bit of atmospheric physics, that god will disappear. It's just a god of the gaps. And you may all have seen that lovely cartoon, much beloved of mathematicians. A big complex bit of mathematics on the left, a complex bit on the right, and in the middle, then a miracle occurs. And one scientist says to the other, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Now, that's what many people think that Christians believe in a God of the gaps who, by definition, gets smaller and smaller when the gaps are filled until he disappears altogether. Now, I want you to try and follow the logic of this. Because I could not understand why Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, and many others that I have debated say to people, you must choose between God and reason and God and science. You must choose between them. I could not understand it until I suddenly realized that the God that they were thinking about is not the God of the Bible at all, simply a God of the gaps. And so then it occurred to me that this is true. If you define God to be the explanation for what science has not yet explained, then of course you have to choose between God and science as a matter of definition, as a matter of sheer logic. And then it became utterly clear to me that the real problem here is a false concept of God. But you see, the God of the Bible 
is not a God of the gaps. He's God of the whole show. Perhaps you've noticed that if you've ever read page one of the Bible, which I can thoroughly recommend, <laughs> in the beginning, God created the bits of the universe we don't yet understand. Well, that's not how it reads in my version of the Bible. It's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, which is a merism, which means everything. He created the whole show, the bits we understand, the bits we don't understand. So God doesn't disappear with an advance in science. Far from it, actually. <clears throat> The other big statement is, in the beginning was the word, all things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be that came to be. And that's why when Newton discovered gravitation, he didn't say, ah, I've discovered gravity, I don't need God. No. What he did say was, just read this stuff about gravity, isn't it marvelous? What a genius of a God to do it that way. And that's my own view. The more we understand of the marvelous way in which the universe operates, the more we admire the God that did it that way. That is why Oxford Natural History Museum was built, to show the marvels of the work of the Creator. And that's the way all of our minds work, by the way. The more you understand of art, the more you can admire Rembrandt, not the, re the, the less. The more you understand of engineering, the more you can admire a turbofan jet, not the less. And so the more we understand of the universe, the more we can worship the God who did it that way. Science is not competing at all with belief in God. But now we come to the third major point. False ideas about the nature of scientific explanation. See, what do we mean by explanation? I came across the law of gravity at school. I found it very interesting. And I enjoyed teaching students for many years how you can derive the motion of the planets from Newton's laws. But I was not taught quite correctly at my school. Because they told me that the law of gravity explained gravity. It doesn't. Later, of course, I came to read Newton's famous work, The Principia, where he explicitly says, I've no idea, I'm paraphrasing the Latin now, I've no idea what gravity is. What he did was brilliantly discover a law that enables us to do calculations that we can land people on the moon and all this kind of thing. But the law of gravity does not tell you what gravity is. Nobody knows what gravity is. Nobody knows what energy is. And therefore, just staying within the science, the fascinating thing I began to realize is this, even within science, a scientific explanation doesn't even explain all the science. It's limited in its power. But the trouble is, when someone says, ah, but there's a scientific explanation, A, they're not told that it is likely to be incomplete, and B, it's not the whole explanation of the phenomenon, rarely in any instance. It was a philosopher, Wittgenstein, that put his finger on it. He said something like this. The great delusion of modernity is that the laws of nature explain the universe for us. The laws of nature describe the universe. They describe the regularities, but they explain nothing. Think about that. But now think about something much simpler than Wittgenstein. His philosophy is not always all that easy. So think about explanation of why the water is boiling. Well, it's boiling because I've got a kettle and there's a gas flame and the heat from the flame is being conducted through the base of the kettle and it's agitating the molecules of water. They're moving faster and faster and faster. That's why it's boiling. And you say, no, that's not why it's boiling. And I say, why is it boiling then? I want a cup of tea. Now, why are you laughing? Think about your laughter. What amuses you 
is that you realize instinctively that that is a silly point to make because there are two perfectly valid explanations of why it's boiling. The scientific one and the personal desire one. I want a cup of tea. What we're now in the realm of is distinguishing levels of explanation. One in terms of science, law, and mechanism, and the other in terms of personal desire or agency. And of course, the very interesting thing about those explanations is that they're both necessary to explain the thing in total. They complement each other. They don't conflict or compete. And the last one always intrigues me. People have been drinking tea for centuries and enjoying it before they knew anything about heat equations. The personal explanation is generally more important than the scientific one, although not in the laboratory. And the point is, ladies and gentlemen, think of that extrapolated to the level of our understanding of the universe. The God explanation is the personal agency explanation. The scientific understanding of the laws of nature and so on is the law and mechanism explanation. Do they conflict? Of course not. They're different kinds of explanation, which is why it is profoundly wrong, I believe, to teach people or to suggest that God is the same kind of explanation as the scientific explanation, and therefore you've got to choose between them. Let me put it another way, just to focus it in your mind so that you can remember it. Newton's law of gravitation no more competes with God as an explanation than the law of internal combustion competes with Henry Ford as an explanation of the motor car. You would never think of saying to people, look, here's a motor car. You've got two explanations, Henry Ford or the law of internal combustion, please choose between them. That would be absurd because they're answering different kinds of question about that motor car. And it's exactly the same as the universe. Richard Swinburne, one of my colleagues at Oxford, a brilliant philosopher, says, I do not deny that science explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains. The very success of science in showing us how deeply orderly the natural world is provides strong grounds for believing that there's an even deeper cause for that order. Now, the final point about explanation is very important because it's used in the God delusion. Using God, and this is a quote from Dawkins, as an explanation is absurd since God is by definition more complex than the thing you're explaining. That sounds terrific until you apply it to Richard Dawkins' book in which it is stated. The God delusion is moderately complex. It's about 400 pages. So when I got it into my hands, I started wondering about its origin. And somebody said it originated in the much more complex brain of Richard Dawkins, and I dismissed that because that explanation is more complicated than the thing I'm trying to explain. <laughs> Do you see the absurdity of it? Now, it's so interesting to ask the question, why do we accept an explanation that's, in one sense, more complex than the thing we're explaining? Well, we do it all the time. Every time you have dinner and see a menu in front of you, you look at it. And if you were asked about the origin of the menu, there are just a few words in the menu but you immediately say that has originated in a human mind. Oh, but there are automatic machines that have printed it and there's paper and ink. Never mind. There's a mind behind it. How do you know that? Because there's language on it. And you associate language with mind. So the mind that's behind the menu is infinitely more complex than the menu, and yet you would not admit an explanation of that menu a complete explanation that was simply in terms of automatic machinery. Now, hold that just for a moment. Because you see, 
the meaning of the message. As the Nobel Prize winner Roger Sperry said, it won't be found in the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. Now, the interesting thing about that is this. We've lived to discover not a word of five or ten letters, but a word of three and a half billion letters in exactly the right order. What about postulating a mind by that? You see, it begins to look as if of the two worldviews, atheism and theism, the most sensible one is the one that says, in the beginning was the word. Now, I'm going to very rapidly go through something, thinking about thinking, the marvelous success of mathematics with all these equations and so on. And just a little analogy for you to think about. I sometimes amuse myself by asking my colleagues, what do you do science with? And they say, well, I do it with my mind. Well, they usually say brain because they don't believe there's a mind. Okay. And I say, tell me about this brain that you do science with. Well, it's the end result of a mindless, unguided process. Oh, really, I say, and you trust it. You trust the end product of a mindless, unguided process. If you thought your computer was like that, would you trust it? Of course not. And then I probe and I point out to them that Darwin had this problem. He had a horrid doubt whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Now, here I'm coming to the main and the final point, and it's this, and I'm just going to go straight to this quotation, the second one. If Dawkins is right that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own atheism. Now, there are atheists that say exactly the same thing. So what I'm suggesting is that atheism ultimately undermines the validity of the very rationality we need not only for science, but any thinking whatsoever. So there is our title stroked out. And there is the title which I might prefer. Is faith in atheism anti-science and anti-reason? I think it has a positive answer, ladies and gentlemen. Science and atheism conflict because atheism logically leads to doubt about the validity of the rational processes needed to do science. Thank you very much. And I'm hoping that by joining you here on stage, there'll be a transfer of some of your intellect and gifting. So <laughs> here we go. I'm hoping the same thing. <laughs> um, we've had loads and loads of questions come up on Pigeonhole. Um, let me see if I can read you some of them, John, and maybe I can give you just the first three that have come up okay. and um, see in what order and how you want to address them. The first says, how do we reconcile Luke's genealogy of the inception of man 6,000 years ago and Francis Collins's estimation that humans have existed for around 100,000 years? So that's the first question. A second question that's come through, I don't know if this is by a friend of yours or not, because it makes an assumption. You and I both reject evolutionary anthropogenesis and that we are God's special creation created from scratch. Why do scientists say that there is so much evidence that humans evolved and were not created? And a totally separate one, a third one, some hide behind God's sovereignty. If he's all-knowing and all-powerful, then he knew that I would be a naturalist. Therefore, I have nothing to be blamed for. I'm his fault. And what's your response to that? So three really easy starter questions, as you can see. We prepped them beforehand, just so you know. I missed the last one. <laughs> Let me read it to you again. Some hide behind God's sovereignty. If he is all-knowing and all-powerful, then he knew that I would be a naturalist. Therefore, I have nothing to be blamed for. I'm his fault. 
that could be said on so many things. I'm his fault. What's your response? Uh, okay. I understand that very well. The question brought up by, the issue brought up by the first two questions is the huge question of evolution and so on. And I think rather than just plunge into details, how I would start my thinking, because this is really a topic for a lecture which I did not give. And it's important that you realize that nothing that I have said depends on evolution either way, except for my mention of the significance of DNA. Now, let me say a couple of things. Firstly, many people are confused as to what the word evolution actually means. There are at least five different meanings. Now, I'm not going to go through them all. But the basic confusion is this. It was perpetrated by Richard Dawkins and perpetuated by him in a very famous book. And in that book, he says that Darwin's natural selection, that mechanism he discovered, is responsible for the existence and the variation of all of life. He has had to retract the first part of that because evolution understood in the normal way can only operate whatever it does once you've got life going. It cannot explain the origin of life at all. And that's an infinitely greater question. And it's the one that as a mathematician interests me most. The chemists, and there are some very high-powered chemists that I know very well, just say we know nothing from a scientific perspective about the origin of life. Now, the problem is this. The real difficulties are with the origin of life. And that's why people concentrate on the other thing. The question of how much does natural selection do and how much does it not do? Now, it clearly does something. Just look around at this room. There was selection going on. Your father married your mother and so on. And for all I know, there may even be selection going on in this room. It does happen at <laughs> conferences like this, and so on. And the point is, that means that we all look different, but we're all human. Now, as a mathematician, and I must speak as one, I'm not a biologist. So I'm out of my field here, although I read as much biology as I can. And as a mathematician, there is great skepticism because from what I can see is that clearly natural selection, mutation, and so on do something. But the question is, does the mechanism, will it take all the weight that's put on it? And there I am very skeptical. And I notice an increasing number, it's small at the moment, of biologists, and they're the ones that consult on this, are getting more and more skeptical about it. Because it's very easy to say, as Dawkins does, it's very small increments and so on. And yet then somebody else comes in and says, oh, no, 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 evolution went in huge leaps. How did those happen? And it's stating the actual mechanism by which something happened. That's where the difficulty is. You see, let me wear my atheist hat. I wear it every Saturday. Um, <laughs> let me wear an atheist hat for a moment. If I'm an atheist and a materialist, then evolution is the only possibility. Matter has got to be able to organize itself into life, and life has got to be able to organize itself in increasing complexity up to humans and their minds. But where's the evidence that a mechanism could actually do that? I feel the verdict is increasingly out. Now, Francis Collins, I regard him as a friend. And he and I have discussed these things and so on. You see, the basic issue between us, if I may be quite open about it, and he wouldn't mind that because he would say, something against what I'm about to say is this. All scientists who are Christians seem to agree that there was what we call a singularity at the start of the universe. 
they call it the Big Bang. They've no difficulty in God being involved in that in a special way. But secondly, coming up to much more recently, Francis Collins and I would sit here together and affirm that Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead. So we believe in supernatural intervention much more recently. In fact, more than that, if you read his book and hear how he became a Christian, you'll discover that he agrees with me that becoming a Christian is a supernatural intervention of God. So that's even more recent, isn't it? The area of disagreement, ladies and gentlemen, is were there more events of that discrete kind in history near the beginning? God creates the universe. That's God's direct intervention. But what about life's beginning and human life's beginning? My own view is this, that these are discrete historical events where God did do something. Now, the very interesting thing about the Genesis account is it simply puts it, and God said, and God said, and God said. I read that to be unpacking the famous statement of John, in the beginning was the word. This is the word speaking and creating. Not very often, but originating the universe, originating life, and originating human life. Now, the question is, if that is true, how would you detect it archaeologically or anatomically? And here I think genuinely that the verdict is out. But I am going to refrain from giving a massive lecture on this. If you want to read what I think about some of these issues, or should I put it more carefully, what I thought a few years ago, because I hope I've refine some of my thought processes. I've got a book called God's Undertaker, A Science Buried God, which deals with the first couple of questions. And then I've got a book on Genesis called Seven Days That Divide the Earth. So I think perhaps I'll leave that there. You want to move on? Oh, the other question was the, the matter of, well, if I'm a naturalist in my worldview, I take it the person does mean if I'm a naturalist like Darwin was. Um, looking out species and being very interested in nature. I think you mean it in the philosophical sense. Well, it's God's fault. Now, the subject of God's sovereignty and human responsibility is as big as the universe. Nice big questions you ask. You I just see. give you the easy ones, John. Yes. Well, I'll have to come to the bottom line on this. Of course, if we believe in God at all, the idea that he is at some level in control goes with the territory. And I must say in my personal life, it has been so reassuring to understand that God is intensely interested in my own life. How often my wife and I have read that Psalm 139, that God knows all the days of my life before they've come to be. That's one side of it. But the other side of it is the very same Bible that tells me that also tells me that I am responsible before God as a human being, and that is a glorious thing. It all goes back to the beginning of Genesis again. In the garden, we have the story of the basic ingredients of morality and choice. Do you remember the story? Everything was allowed except one tree that they weren't allowed to eat. Now, that would have been meaningless if they couldn't eat it. They obviously were capable of eating it. But God said, you don't eat that. Why did that happen at all? Because he was dignifying human beings with something that no other creature has got. And that is the capacity of being a moral being. That's a marvelous thing. That capacity of choice is what makes it possible to love or hate. It makes it possible to do good or to do evil. It means that in the image of God, we are moral beings. Now, the bottom line is this. Can you use the objection, well, if I'm a naturalist in my thinking, that's God's fault. It isn't God's fault. 
The bottom line for me, ladies and gentlemen, now this is a huge topic. The bottom line for me is this, is that one day I will be judged and the criterion of judgment from the Christian perspective is whether or not I've believed in Jesus Christ. That would be utterly meaningless and utterly immoral if I hadn't the capacity to do that. So let me phrase myself carefully. The gift of the capacity to trust is something everybody possesses. It's one of God's greatest gifts to us. The issue for me as a human being is whether I use that gift to trust God or to reject him. And if that's what I will be judged for, then I may be absolutely sure, since God is utterly righteous, that I have the capacity to do it. John, I wonder if I can ask you some follow-up questions that are coming through on Pigeon Hall, some related and some not. Um, one is about uh, scientific claims in the scriptures and scientific facts or mistakes, as this question suggests. What about all the scientific errors in the Bible, is the question. Noah's Ark and the Flood, the absence of dinosaurs, and that the earth is flat. So a question about the specific claims of the Bible and their accuracy. There's a second question. Well, let's take the first question. Just we? one at a time? Sure. I'd love to know where the Bible says the earth is flat. That's news to me. Secondly, this idea that there are scientific errors. It might be better to say the claim is that there are errors of fact. Now, the ones mentioned there were the flood. Is the flood an error of fact? My initial reaction to that would be to point out that every legend, mythology, tradition in the world, there is a memory of a huge flood. I'm not so sure that it is an error of fact. And I think we need to be very careful here because the Bible has been with us a very long time. And constantly it has been accused of factual errors. For example, I wrote a book not long ago on the prophet Daniel. It used to be dismissed because it mentions a Belshazzar, Belshazzar's feast. And people said, well, he never existed. There's no evidence that this man ever existed, so we cannot take this book seriously. Then a cuneiform tablet turns up and there's the name Belshazzar on it. Now, what do you do, you see? The point is it revises instantly attitudes that said it was factually an error. And I want to come round on the positive side because I was at a very prestigious gathering of scientists and academics in another country and I'd been asked to say something about the Christian position on the origin of the universe. And of course, I cited Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there was a fairly distinct negative reaction which was focused by someone stopping me in the middle of my little talk and saying come on Professor Lennox you don't mean to tell us in the 21st century that Genesis has anything to contribute to the discussion surely you were joking well I said I'm sorry to disappoint you I was not joking I said um, in the beginning who came up with the idea of a beginning first, Genesis or science? Because you see, I was alive in the 1960s, not the 1860s, but in the 1960s, <laughs> I was alive when the evidence started coming in that there was an origin to space-time, the expansion of the universe, the microwave background, all that kind of stuff. And I remember so well the resistance of the British scientific fraternity to this, so much so that in our most prestigious scientific periodical, Nature, there appeared an editorial written by a man called Maddox saying, we must not go down this route of admitting a beginning to space-time. Why? Because it'll give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. So here was the most the biggest advance in astrophysics and cosmology in the 20th century being resisted 
because it paralleled scripture. And I said to this crowd of people, I said, you know, if you had opened your minds, I mean, if scientists in the past had opened their minds to considering the biblical worldview, instead of being completely wedded to Aristotle for centuries and his eternal universe, you might just have looked for evidence of a beginning earlier than you did. So please don't tell me that the Bible is irrelevant to science. Now, the Bible isn't a textbook of science. I don't teach algebra from Leviticus, and I never will. <laughs> but don't let us run away with the fact that when the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it's talking about the very same universe that science talks about. So I think when people accuse it of errors, we have to begin to, the only way of doing it is to investigate them one by one. And there are plenty of books out there. The person that asked that question should go and get a hold of some of these books because you can't answer all these questions in an afternoon. But for me, the absolutely stunning thing about the Bible is that it knows that there was a beginning. And secondly, that it knows that information is a fundamental concept. That has only been realized in the last century. In the beginning was the Word, and God said the idea that the creation is packed with information resonates with me as a mathematician utterly profoundly. So let's go a little bit on the positive side, because it seems to me there's very powerful evidence there. What is the second half of your question? Um, I've got two more questions from Pigeonhole, and then by virtue of having the power of the microphone, I want to throw in one of my own. <laughs> so um, the first one is, how does a non-material God interact with the material world? And I wonder, John, if you could speak more broadly to um, people here and the thousand who, and plus who are listening around the world, something of your own experience of if there are people who want to engage with God more personally as well, what you m might say to them about how they might encounter God, how they might hear from God, how they might experience God. So well, I will answer that question. If you will answer me, how my non-material mind interacts with my material body. It's the same problem, ladies and gentlemen. The interesting thing is we have been brought up, many of us, though not all of us, with the idea that the material is the real stuff. It's the real stuff. And the spirit is all airy-fairy, and the immaterial is, is, well, just a minute. Actually, it's the immaterial tends to be the real stuff. Now, I've just mentioned a moment ago information. Information is not material. And here's the great irony of 21st century science. It's come to see that an immaterial quantity is utterly fundamental to science. That's the end of materialism, of course, as far as... I'm concerned, without even going in the direction of God. Now, all I can do is say what the biblical claim is. It is that the fundamental stuff in the universe is not matter at all, it's spirit. God is spirit. Now, what is spirit? Well, when it comes to questions like that, it's like saying, what is gravity? Or what is time? As Augustine said, we all know what it means until we try to define it. And therefore, we have to step back and ask ourselves, does it make sense to understand that there is more than one kind of being, if you like, around? More than one kind of substance is not a good word. Is it a more sensible explanation through our experience and everything else to understand the universe as monist? It's only one kind. Or is there, dare I use a dread word for some philosophers who I see around, is there more to dualism that a lot of people will allow? And as I understand it, I have this problem in understanding myself. You see, I can influence the atoms in your body without touching you in this room, all of you, instantaneously, all I need to do is shout fire. <laughs> and you'll all move. And here is something immaterial, a bit of information, F-I-R-E, and it'll get you moving. How does that work? Nobody knows, ladies and gentlemen. 
just nobody knows. And I can focus this down just by telling you, can I tell them a brief story? When I was faced with a thousand physicists and one came up to me and he said, and it's a question like this, he said, you know, it was a lovely talk, he said, but I detect you're a Christian. He was pretty sharp. And, <laughs> and he said, look, he said, you're obliged to believe that Jesus Christ was man and God at the same time. Dear to I said, that's right. So he said, come on now, he said. Not in the 21st century. So I said, well, you've asked the question, can I ask you one? He said, sure, ask away. I said, tell me, what is consciousness? I don't know. I said, that's okay, I'll take an easier one then. What is energy? Well, we can measure it and we can, I said, what is it? A longer pause, I don't know. Oh, I said, do you believe in consciousness and energy? He said, yes. And you don't know what they are? No. I said, should I write you off as a physicist? Oh, please don't, he said. <laughs> you were going to write me off, weren't you? When I claimed to believe that Jesus Christ was both God and man, he said I was. He said, are you going to do it now? See, ladies and gentlemen, this kind of thing goes way beyond our understanding. We don't know what the words non-material means. We don't even know what material is. And the point I was trying to demonstrate to him then and to you now is that we don't have to completely understand concepts in order to believe them. So I said, you tell me to this man why you believe in consciousness and energy. Well, that was a bit difficult. So I helped him out being kind Irishman. I said, I think one of the reasons you believe in them is because those concepts, even though you don't understand them, they have explanatory power. He said, that's right. <laughs> well, I said, that's what I believe about Jesus Christ. I don't understand it. It's way beyond matter and energy and everything else. But the only explanation to me that makes sense of the facts particularly what comes through the Bible and my own personal experience, are that Christ is both God and man. It has explanatory power. And that is enough for me as it is enough for you when it comes to much lesser things. Now, that doesn't really answer your question. But it's <laughs> a start of an answer. Um, Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to be selfish and ask you one of my own, John. Oh, okay. Um, um, I wondered, as you can see, there are several hundred people in the room here, over a thousand watching on the live stream or from all over the world. And I wondered if you could just take a few minutes to share something of your heart with us. If you wanted to give us a, a message or a commissioning of any kind, what would that be? What message would you want to share with those who are listening online? And those Can I put this on again or not? Is it difficult to put my slides on again? It's possible, John. Which one do you want? Just the last one. This one here. They should come up for a second. If they don't, they don't. No, they're not going to. Don't worry. What I would say to you is this, and it's lovely to have people watching around the world, that what you've heard me say is only a start. It's only a start because all we've dealt with is the proposition, is it irrational? to believe in God? Is it anti-science and anti-reason? The answer is no. And I have mentioned that to me, the biblical account makes much more sense. In the beginning was the word, but that's only the start of a huge story. And as a human being, I look for a story. I look for a narrative into which, which is big enough to fit my life into. Now, where does it fit into this story? And one of the reasons I'm a Christian, as distinct from anything else, is that the biblical story I find is big enough for me to fit into it meaningfully. Now, what do I mean by that? In the beginning was the Word, but then the next step is the Word became human. That God himself who created and upholds this universe 
became human, Jesus Christ. Why did he do that? Because God from the very beginning is interested in the unique species that is made in his image. Nothing else in the universe is made in the image of God. The stars and the sun and the flowers show his glory. They weren't made in his image. You were. That gives every one of us a huge dignity as creatures. But it's bigger than that. Because we've been dignified by this capacity to choose, we've misused it. We all know that. We all know we've misused it. And that's why often when God is talked about, we get afraid of the idea rather than saying how wonderful because we don't want to get too close. And the magnificent thing about Christianity, and may I say it frankly, Christianity competes with no other religion. How's that? Because it offers me something that no one else does. It offers me the knowledge of a personal friendship with God and forgiveness, and we all need forgiveness. And in our quieter moments, we know it. Forgiveness and a relationship with God which doesn't await some final decision after death, but starts now. That is unique in all of world history, philosophy, religion, and everywhere else. Because the central claim is, and I often say to people, look, before you reject Christianity, see what it claims first. And what is the claim? The claim is simply this, that to deal with a fundamental alienation, or to put it crudely, the fact that I've messed up my life, I've not been perfect, ask my wife. <laughs> the fact that I've messed up my life means and is an expression of a fundamental alienation between me and God. The only repair that I know of that's possible is what Christ achieved by dying for me. How does that work? I don't know. It's like gravity. It's like immaterial things. But that it does work, I'm utterly convinced. You see, ladies and gentlemen, in science we like things to be testable. One of the reasons I'm a Christian believer is that it's testable. You see, Christ promises that if we face the mess we've made and repent, change our minds, then he is prepared to receive us, accept us, and pardon us. But not only that, to give us new life and new power. And you can test if that works. When you see again and again and again people, young people particularly, over my life, I've watched it, where they've nowhere to go, they've no meaning, some of them are in despair, and they come to trust Christ. And you meet them six months later, and their lives are totally changed. When you see that again and again, you add two and two, and you get four. This transformation of life has something to do with a commitment to Jesus Christ. And so my message to all of you is this. If that's meaningful to you and you've experienced it, you cannot keep it to yourself. And you can go out into our society without feeling ashamed that it's all anti-scientific and irrational. It's the exact opposite. If God hadn't created the universe, scientists would have had nothing to do. <laughs> and so I would encourage you to examine it. Commit yourself where you feel there's enough evidence. Because you see, Christ is perfectly fair. He wants our faith to be evidence-based. And so he gives us the evidence in the New Testament, in the lives of other people. So if you're not sure about these things, start reading the New Testament, ask your questions, but also get a hold of some of the people around you who live credible Christian lives and ask them what it's all about. Thank you very much. John, thank you. <laughs> Professor John Lennox. those of you on the live stream, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you as you go through the rest of your day and please do keep in touch.